You know who they are, Dawn. Wonderful. They're going back in the 60s. You're dating yourself a little bit. Yeah. I didn't know if everyone would know who they are. That's, yeah, that's, that's Yogi and Boo Boo. And Yogo, Yo, uh, and, uh, yeah, <laughs> and Yogi is saying to Boo Boo, Boo Boo, he says, I'm losing control. I don't know who's steering the ship. And I think, you know, with Sunday, sometimes I come because I can feel that in myself. I like, I'm not sure who's steering the ship. So I need to come every Sunday to be reminded that it's, it's like taking a shower that refreshes me, that God is steering the ship. That's what we saw last week when we talked about Noah after the fall and how God was with him and there was no steering mechanism on the ship. And God guided them through and brought them to Mount Ararat and landed them safely in that region of Mesopotamia so that he could do what he wanted to do. And I was reminded of a time that uh, we were on a ship, my wife and I and family. We had won this wonderful trip uh, through the auto business and they took us on a, on a Disney cruise. It was fantastic, except that we figured later they must have got a deal on all that because it was an expensive trip because it was during hurricane season. And the boat was rocking. And my wife has this thing. She gets a little schizophrenic. And she's out at 2 a.m. in the morning. I don't know what she's going to do. I'm sleeping. But she's just all paranoid and worried about we're going to crash. And our whole family is on the boat. And, like, she didn't trust the captain of the ship. She didn't know the captain of the ship. She didn't trust that the captain of the ship knew what he was doing. Had the training and the stuff to guide us through, you know. So we... <clears throat> ended up at the Bahamas the next day. They took us to the Bahamas, and we got out, and, and she said, I'm not getting back on the boat. I said, oh, my, I mean, really? Really? At times like this, can't, you know, it's like I got a wife who's not getting back on a boat at, in the Bahamas. <clears throat> Until we took a cab to the beach, and she saw that everybody was boarding up the windows because the hurricane was headed that way. She got back on the boat. <laughs> In life, I'm not sure sometimes or don't trust who's steering the ship. We've been working our way through Genesis. And it's just been an incredible revealing, the short time it is to me, that God is continually telling us, it says, in the beginning, God, I'm steering the ship. I know where it's headed. I know what's in store for you. I know the plans that I have for you as we hear in Jeremiah. And God is revealing himself constantly through the 66 books of the Bible to assure us of that, to remind us of that, so that when we come and we need to be refreshed from a world that's out there that says, I'm not sure who's steering the ship. With all this speculation and confusion and uncertainty, uh, yeah, sometimes I question who's steering the ship, and God says, no, I am steering the ship. It is one God in this nation, and in this world, because I created it. Well, last week we learned that God is steering the ship and that we can trust him. And this week, as we head forth, we wrapped up with the title, Don't Get Caught in the Rain and What Are You Building? And we flew, floated through the account of Noah and the ark, and we got to dry ground, and he was relying on God to steer, and we, as we should rely on God to steer. And in times in life, I think it reminded me of that sometimes I have to let go and let God. And that isn't always so easy. Abraham Lincoln, once in one of these tough situations, one of these storms of life, that Eric talked about, and what a great reminder to us of who's steering the ship. But in one of these tough times and tough situations, uh, Abraham Lincoln said, it's not my concern whether God is on our side. He says, my greatest concern is to be on God's side, for God is always right. And we're not asking God to be on our side. It's like we should be on God's side, being fervent about trying to be on his side and doing that through learning the script and what he has to say to us. You see, it's not what we think of God. It's what he thinks of us. And so as we 
head through this week and try to wrap up a continuation of don't get caught in the rain and what are you, know, what are you building. I want to I wanna switch it up a little bit and I want to encourage you to say, which is going to be an interesting dynamic, keep building. Keep building. Noah, it took him 100 years to build that ark and we talked about that, but like keep building. And I say, end well. That was the other message that came to me as I, I read these two accounts, and we'll kind of pick them out as we finish up uh, Genesis um, 9 through 11. That's where we ended up step, stepping out. And so this week, keep building. End well, whatever you're doing. And I don't care what it is, if it's ending the day well, ending a job well, ending a career well, ending a vacation well, Ending a graduation well, ending a driver's training well, it's a good thing, isn't it, Grant? End well. You won't give you your license. End well. Keep building. Keep at it. I want to encourage you that. So, as we pick up and slide into our script, a couple things. Table talks in the back, which is a, a finalization of that. It's the same, but please feel free to get one. That is just some questions I throw on paper that uh, are related to the script to kind of stimulate table talk, I call it. Uh, so you're welcome to that. The other thing I put out there, and I used it before, was uh, somewhat of a modification from a dear friend out of uh, Canada, a pastor and a counselor that does it. And it's kind of the, the from, from creation <laughs> to uh, eternity or the end of revelation like in just a small pad and kids you can take it put it in your book parents you can take it put it on the fridge and it's like well how many how many of these things can I fill in as we go through this because there's major points we got that right we got creation we got the fall we got the flood we got the tower of Babel we got all the Abraham Isaac and Jacob so those types of things so you're welcome to that and that might be a little bit fun so we pick up and I want to just pick up where we left off, which was basically in, um, not getting it there, Aaron, it's not moving forward for me. Actually, it's Genesis 8, 18, uh, is where I want to pick up, and I can read it, we can catch up. And it's where God says, so Noah went out and his sons and his wife and his wife's sons with him. When the ark landed, then he went out, and he got out of the boat. And then he goes on, and, and he talks about how in Genesis uh, 8, 20, 21, it says, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Those were the additional seven that God had told him to bring without spot or blemish. The Lord smelled the soothing aroma, and the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground on account of man, for the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth, and I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. God's promise. We talked about how God loves us and accepts us in our weakness. He realizes the intent of our hearts is evil. And the difference we spoke about just for the, those that were here and those that didn't get it. If you go back to 6, 5 when God talks about the intent of the heart and before the flood and how they were wicked. And here he just says that the intent of the heart is evil. But uh, there was no wickedness. We don't have to be wicked in our evilness, in the intents of our hearts. That's something God has given us a hedge against. I've seen over and over, and I'm, I'm getting little glimpses of it, and see if I'm right as we follow along, that the, when the wickedness of man is involved, and the wickedness often deals with people hurting people. It's not about having an offense with God, or fighting with God, or having an argument with God. It's often when we're hurting people that God steps in and says, I'm going to stop it. I'm going to end this. So it's when wickedness comes in, and the wickedness, I don't even want to talk about it, because if you read some of the ancient history, it's, it's wicked. <laughs> like, you can't hardly think how and imagine how wicked people were, but it was wicked. God responds different when people hurt people. That's what it seems to be. Well, 1,657 years have passed since we started three weeks ago. <laughs> My, how time flies, right? Chapter 9. It gets us to chapter 9. And I don't know what that's about. Mute, that's what it says. I didn't mute it. Not a message for you up front. Okay. Thank you. 
And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. That's a message that we heard also with Adam and Eve, didn't we? It's really a redo of chapter 1 and 2. It's fill and subdue the earth. That's what chapter 9 is. Life was good. Fill the earth, meaning the land, the country, the nations, the world. Fill the whole earth. That's what God was telling us to do. And it's no different today, 4,500 years later, <laughs> when we get the Great Commission, Matthew 28, what does God say? Go, go. God is consistent, and that's what Scripture says. He says, go, go, and proclaim good news, bring good news. Get about the earth that I've created and that I've given you. It's a wonderful thing. And then he says in verse 2, and all the animals are still under your authority because, you know, the, the boats landed. We're in Mount Ararat, Ararat in, the, in the Mesopotamian area, which I'll show you in a map in a little bit where that was. And like, okay, so Noah gets out and all the kids get out and his wife gets out and all the uh, son's wives get out and then all the animals start coming out two by two. And what a funny picture in some ways because there's nothing. You're the only existence on the whole earth. It's like there's nothing. And all these animals come out two by two and it's like, well... Ah, be careful because, you know, you don't want one of them to get hurt. That could be a problem because they're supposed to reproduce too. So these animals are coming out of the ark and it's like, now what do we do? Noah goes and presents the offering, which we read of, and it's like, okay, time to set up camp, I guess. So it's a redo, a reminder to us that the commission's the same. It hasn't changed God is so consistent. He said, the animals are going to be under your authority. And he says, in fact, so you know this, I'm going to make them afraid of you. If you read verse 2 as we go through the scripture, they're going to, they're going to run from you. So, okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then the meat and potatoes of the scripture. In fact, God says, these animals are so much under your authority, you can have them for lunch. He gives you the right to eat meat. That's the first time. Before that, you could make a pretty good case for being a vegetarian. Now God says you can eat meat. You can have it and the green plant, but he says don't be cruel to them. He gives us that picture. Don't be cruel to them. And then he moves on in verse chapter 9, 4 through 10. I'll just give you a synopsis. He talks about a reminder of dignity of the human life, how you're important, you're different. Remember, you're different. If there's a message that I was really emphatic on, and even this morning, is that you're created in God's image. He loves you. He says, you look like me. You're different. In fact, if you're harmed, if you harm each other, you're going to have to pay. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. You shed blood, I will require blood. Life is blood. Blood is life. And he said, even if an animal were to take a man's life or a lady's life or a child's life, their life would be required of them. It's an interesting part there. So then chapter 9, we move on to 11 through 13, and God says, I want to make an agreement with you. He says, I'll establish my covenant with you in all flesh and never again be cut off by the water of the flood. Neither shall there again be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, this is the sign of the covenant which I am making between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all successive generations. Know the sign, kids? What's the sign? I don't have my slide so we can have some fun. What's the sign? What's the covenant? Rainbow, who said it? Good job, rainbow. That bow in the sky. God says, that's going to be my sign. You're different. I want you to know that. God here makes formal what he felt in his heart earlier in 821 when he says, I will never again. Even though he realized the intent of our hearts, he said, I will never again. And it gives us a glimpse, a small peek into God's heart that God makes a comment about the intentions of man's heart is evil or the original sin, but he says, I'll never again, even knowing that, I'll work with them. We are each born into this world with a sin condition. We know that. We realize that. Look at kids. That's why you got to discipline them. No wonder we have to teach them. It's hardwired into all of us. 
yet God to restore, desires to restore a relationship with us. One of his signs is to make a covenant. A covenant is a divine ordinance with signs or pledges, a perpetual sign that will remain till the return of Jesus. That's a picture of our rainbow, which, just imagine it. <laughs> We're going to have another sign this morning. <clears throat> it's a different sign. It's a sign that Jesus gave us in a, a covenant that says, in a, in a command to share in the cup and in the bread to remember what he did for us. That's another sign that we, he has given us that we're going to do this morning after we talk a little bit. That is a sign of God's faithfulness to us was the rainbow. This is a sign of our faithfulness to God. That's how God shows us his love every time it rains, the hope for the whole world to see how much he loves us. I couldn't help but think, what, what sign do I have? What are the signs? What am I building that shows my, say, family that I love them or shows this group of people that I love you in the way that God has designed me to be or to show others that I love them or, more importantly, to show God that I love him? What am I building? What am I doing that would, would show that? I think that's the message. He gives us signs, and what kind of signs do we have? Keep building and well in all you do I said, life's not about centuries and decades and years and months and days and hours, but it's really about seconds. It's about every second. So then in chapter 9, as we move on, the promise of the rainbow, 19 through 28, we'll just go. It's here where we get Noah's heritage statement. And I'll tell you, as I studied 9, 10, 11, as I went back through them again and tried to rewrote them, it was, it was a, a couple things happened. Number one, getting the momentum back because of where I was last week and where I wanted to finish up and had to, had to change some things. But also, we get a lot of genealogy in 9 and uh, 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 10 and 11. We get a lot of that. It's like, well... That's very difficult to stick with and to keep someone's interest, right? And we got the Tower of Babel and, uh, is the story, and we got the rainbow story. Like, well, how are you going to make that applicable? What's the cultural statement? And so this morning, you know, I'm just praying and praying like, Holy Spirit, just give me the gold nugget here. What's going on with it? What, what is it that you want us to walk away with? Because... I want to know that God's steering the ship, and I want to know that I can stand up here and give you a really good sermon. You know, I could have worked hard and put a lot of hours in and say a lot of good things, and you take a lot of good notes, and you go home, and that was good, and this and that. But in order for it to be great, and that's what I prayed about this morning, the only way that it can be great and that it can stick in the bosom of who you are and in your hearts and that you can walk away with and draw from and feed on and know that God is steering the ship is when the Spirit steps in. When you allow the Holy Spirit to step in. And that's not easy. I don't know about you, but I can quench the Spirit because it's all, it's all my head. I, don't, I, don't, I can't get into my heart. That's kind of hard. And that's where God, when he gives us a glimpse of his heart, when he says, I know their intent is evil, but I won't do it again. And I kept thinking as I got into the scripture, I don't see God as this God that is angry with man and has his wrath on man, even though he does have wrath and judgment. But I don't see that in the script as I, as I see how he stepped in with Adam and Eve and come down and found them and how he steps in when we get to the next story. And he doesn't come down hard. He comes down caring and loving and knowing and saying, I see the storms you're going through. I know, I know what you're dealing with. And I said to Miss Beth the, the, for a few, a little bit time here now, I, I don't remember, gang, being 12 and 13 and 14. I don't remember it well. We're 15 and 16 and 17. I get nippets of it, but I don't remember it well. And I said to you before a few weeks ago, it's really important to me that you see the goodness of God when you come here Sunday morning, that it's important to you. Because that's what you're going to build your life on. And that's what's going to stand when you go into the storms of life. And that's what's going to be there when you're building for God and people are ridiculing you. And contempt. And you go off to school and they want to change your minds. Your foundation is what's going to stand 
and where the Spirit spoke to you in a powerful, powerful way. We get Noah's heritage. Two reasons it's important that it's worth reading. It's a record of God doing what he says he will do. And also, kids, we get to see the results of not honoring a parent. Verse 19, God tells the whole earth that it stems from these three sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Noah didn't have any more kids. Shem became the Shemites. They become the Jewish people. Japheth, he was, he's going to live in the house under Shem, which is a, a healthy nation living with his brother. Ham, if you read that account, and there's a lot of speculation. I'm not going to get into it. You can read it and talk about it with your parents. He dishonored his father. That came through every time. He brought a curse upon who? When Noah cursed him, when Noah cursed his son Ham, it wasn't Ham. It was Ham's son, Canaan. Beth has said this many a time, and we need to know it. We might be riding on the coattails of our parents' faithfulness. We may be getting generational benefits. I've seen that. I've seen people, younger ones that are living lives just like unbelievable. But life is good. There's generational blessing. A generational curse. I really feel with my life and my background that God stepped in and pulled me out to break the curse in my generational heritage. What a, what a privilege. Nothing Randy did. And I'm seeing it little by little as it's unfolding amongst my siblings and that they're coming to this knowledge of Christ and where it's meaning something. That it's just not all saying, well, I pray to God. Well, the devil talks to God. Talking to God doesn't cure the problem. Ham's son, Cain, was cursed. He became the Canaanites. We've heard of the Canaanites. We're going to hear a lot about the Canaanites, aren't we, as we move forward. They're idolaters. They're enemies of Israel. Other nations that came off from them were the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Girgashites, the Hiphites. I tease about that. I've heard that. You know, it almost sounds like a disease. When you read the scripture, you know, the ites, you know. Mm. I'll say, you know, what kind of ites do you have? We can lighten it up here a minute. You got the worry ites, <laughs> nervous ites, anxious ites, fear ites. Well, these were the last recorded words of Noah to his boys. Slide 929, it's not there. Noah dies. He dies. He lived 350 years after the flood, after the boat landed. So it's like, what? 350? What went on? Noah dies. That's all it says. Noah's telling his boys, Shem, here's what's going to happen to you. Japheth, here's what's going to happen to you. Ham, here's what's going to happen to you. And nothing. 350 years. Next thing you know, Noah dies. It's like, what have they been doing? I wanted to show you where uh, the ark landed in a slide because it's in modern day Turkey. Big deal. Well, the reason that's important is because that's where they were, modern day Turkey. And to get to Babylon, and the map had where these boys settled, but to get to Babylon or Babel, they had to travel east down over here. Okay? East is an interesting word in Scripture as you follow through. East is not good. It normally deals with the devil and Satan. Adam and Eve traveled east when they went out of the garden. Cain had to travel east after he killed his brother and God booted him out. The these men of Noah traveled east. So east is not a good thing. West is normally known as God's promise.
some point after Noah dies and we get Shem's genealogy, they start moving and they headed east, modern day Iraq. Interesting thing, it's where the Garden of Eden was. Somewhere in there, you look, if you look, you go east to Iraq, you have the Tigris and Euphrates River coming down somewhere in there and that's where Babylon is. They were heading home. They were heading back to the garden. I said that before and I think it's so true. Like people long to be back in the garden. It's a nice place. (laughs) That's where they went. They wanted to go back to the garden. Chapter 10 is called the Table of Nations because it splits it up and tells us where all these kids were. And right on spot. (laughs) He is good. My pointer doesn't work on these for some reason. Don't worry about it. Turkey. See Turkey? See Iraq? Baghdad? Babel. Gives you an idea. Um, Yeah. Verse 8. Now Cush became the father of Nimrod. He became a mighty one on the earth. There's a couple people we're just going to point out in chapter 10, and that's what seems to happen as I went through it. You can't touch on all of it, and we have a lot of genealogy, but there's a few people that God had Moses focus in on for us, and that's what, that's what seems to be is that we get a zoom in of chapter 9. Nimrod, why was he important? It tells us, uh, let's see if I'm, if I'm right. I don't have control for some reason. Well, I'm thinking the next one. And Cush begot Nimrod. He became to be the mighty one on the earth. And that's what it, that's what it says in chapter 10. So, he fathered, Cush fathered Nimrod, a rebel. That's what his name means. Alistair Begg and Stephen Armstrong claim that Nimrod is a, is a type of picture for the Antichrist. And if you're curious about the Antichrist and what that's about, this is supposed to be some glimpse of what maybe the Antichrist would be. Um, uh, next, next slide, please. Okay. Um, Yeah, so this is who is the liar but the one who desires that Jesus is the Christ. This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. So that's what the Antichrist is going to be. Nimrod, who's Nimrod? He was a mighty warrior. He also, also, 10-8, we talked about that. He became a mighty one on the earth. And he also is the first recorded establishment of a kingdom if you go on. He starts Babel. That's the point, one of the points. It becomes later the city of Babylon, the headquarters for the Antichrist. Nimrod became a mighty hunter before the Lord. The term before the Lord is meant against the Lord. Important point. Nimrod was against the Lord. Tells us how Babylon came to be. So, before we leave chapter 10, I want to point out two other people. Eber, had two boys, Peleg and Yachtan. Why are these guys important? Here's why. Follow the lineage, very important. Noah, Shem, Arkashad, Sheila, Eber, it splits it. Peleg, Yachtan. Peleg, Abraham, that's where we're headed. God's kingdom. Yachtan, Babylon, man's kingdom, that's where we're headed. God constantly is laying out how he's dividing. And Jesus talks about that. I didn't come to unite everything. I came to divide. And boy, I sense that in some ways in today's culture. It's like there's some real division. I don't think it's bad. I'm getting convinced that it's okay. 
I mean, my heart is world peace, right? That's what I like. My heart is one church, all united. That's my heart. God says, no, not good. Going to be a problem if we do that. He says, here I split the kingdoms. So that's the genealogy of Noah and how we get to these and the two boys. Separation on the earth. These are the families of the sons of Noah according to their genealogies by their nations. And out of these nations were separated on the earth after the flood. Called the table of nations. Told you that. There it is. That's what we got. Shem's over here down by Babel and all that. Ham's over here in Africa. And we get Japheth up there. And that's where God had placed these. So it's important. Well. Chapter 11. I want to say this. A reflection to instruct us as to why. Why it is. It gives us a zoom in privilege to chapter 10. This is the last pre-Jewish story. Chapter 11. From here on, God's going to establish a new kingdom. And that's why he tells us what he's done with the family tree. This is a bookend to chapter 3, which was the fall. Very important, very interesting. We had Adam and Eve moved eastward. Noah's sons moved eastward. Same thing. We had pride and, and ate fruit. They ate the fruit. That's what Adam and Eve did. We have pride, they build a tower. We had God comes to the garden to see Adam and Eve, and God comes to the tower to see the sons of Noah. And God established his line with Adam and Noah, and God established his line with Shem to Abraham. That's what we're going to see and what's going to unfold. Because at this point, it's a universal religion, a covenant between all people, the rainbow. And now there's going to be a new beginning of more first, of a first city, of a first kingdom, of first use of bricks and tar and belief and creation of the multiple language. That's what we credit chapter 11 to. Our challenge, we're going, we're going to the tower next week, our challenge, what steps am I taking to pass along a godly heritage to the next generation? What am I building? Noah stood against the tide of culture. He was ridiculed, laughed at, mocked, viewed with contempt. He kept building. He knew the ending. He knew the ending. He knew where it was going. So do we. We have the privilege of knowing the ending. I think of, I think of you guys, I think of you, I think like, who do you talk to? Where do you feel safe, you younger ones? Where can you tell anybody anything? You need that place. I need that place. Where do you go? To your friends? They haven't lived any more life than you have. How do you get good instruction? How do you get good insight and good wisdom? And hopefully we can come to our parents or others that we love and respect. Adults are no different. And that's what we're going to see with the story of Tower of Babel is where do you go? And not that it was so bad what they did. And God knows the intent of the heart and how he came down and stepped in that. So Noah stood against the tide of the culture. He was ridiculed and laughed at and mocked and viewed with contempt. He kept building. He knew the ending and so do we. Noah was a light in the darkest of times. And Jesus put it like this. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Amen.